Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the grand rounds of November 15th. Uh, today, I, it's a pleasure to introduce a colleague of mine, uh, James White. James has been director of the Stevenson Cardiovascular MR Center for 10 years now. And over that time, uh, he's been a very productive uh, clinician scientist for the uh, Libin Institute, um, has achieved multiple CIHR and heart and stroke grants, has published over 150 manuscripts, and now finds himself at a career juncture where he's moving on to uh, bigger and better things at the Precision Medicine Program at the Libin Institute. Uh, his intent is to expand his big data initiative uh, to all domains within cardiovascular care. So I'm looking forward to hearing about this today, and uh, I welcome James. Hey, th thanks, Andrew. Um, it's nice to follow somebody else who went on to bigger things as well. And uh, congratulations to you again, Andrew, on your uh, wonderful career. So um, it, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity that's been given to me by the Libin Institute to be able to make this next career move. Um, this is a very exciting time for the Libin Institute, uh, as well as for the entire uh, cardiac sciences department. Um, we really are in a unique situation compared to many other facilities or institutes across the globe. And so I'm excited to be able to uh, talk to you about a vision of where we think things can go over the next five years. Um, the, the first thing that we'll do is just kind of go through a list of questions that we hope to achieve or answer today. And so the first is going to be, what is personalized medicine? But then we'll go on to say, well, what's really required to deliver that? And what foundations exist here within Calgary, within the Cardiovascular Institute, but also within the individual affinity groups across the Department of Cardiac Sciences to actually innovate in this space? And then we'll talk about how we can expand on this existing infrastructure to assist those specific groups across the cardiovascular um, uh, disease care spectrum to be actually introducing personalized decision-making to their patients and why this is of benefit. So five questions, we're gonna start with the first, and that is what is personalized medicine? Well, this is um, a, co a coalition in the United States that actually um, is across many domains, but specializes in personalized care. And they describe it as this way, by combining data from diagnostic tests with an individual's medical history, circumstances and values, healthcare providers can develop targeted treatment and prevention plans with their patients. It's a very good description of what personalized medicine is. But let's actually take it to a little bit more granular level and understand, well, First of all, what are the inputs of that? But most importantly, what are the outputs? What is it that we get out of delivering care in this way? And really what you can see here are four key domains that we've focused on. And I think if you look at other institutions around the globe doing similar exercises, they focus on the same data resources that when brought together in a meaningful way, and we'll talk about what that means, can assist physicians in making better decisions by combining the wealth of that data, computational support from machines, and being able to bridge that with their own neurologic network, which is in their brains, says, what have I done in the past? What's my experience telling me? And the combination of those two things can allow for better decision-making and better outcomes. And the, the downstream impact of this is to improve the efficiency of care by reducing diagnostic and therapeutic errors. And that can improve patient outcomes and deliver value-based care. So let's go through each one of those inputs separately. And we're not going to be, um, we're not going to be too exhaustive, but I do need you to understand some of the benefits and challenges of each of those four domains of data input because that's really what we're talking about when we talk about developing and supporting a personalized care uh, strategy and a program. So what is electronic health information? Well, this seems to be what we all feel is the foundation of personalized care. And I don't dispute that. It provides structured and unstructured electronic documentation of health encounters. 
And this is provided within a common health informatics ecosystem. It's not one system. Um, there's usually a foundational one. We've been very uh, fortunate to have investment in a new one in Alberta. But there are many other systems that contribute to this data resource. And the motivation of accessing it is that it gives a very broad representation of common disease markers that we can routinely obtain in clinical practice. But there are significant limitations to it. The tools that we use to capture this type of information were not and still are not designed to deliver what we call personalized medicine. They are designed to capture information for the administration of healthcare and the billing of healthcare. They're administrative tools, and that's why it's often called secondary use of this data to deliver personalized medicine. And it does lack support for specialized markers, such as genomics, proteomics, specialized imaging markers. And of course, we know there are always barriers to access. And that's based on many things, including privacy concerns, but a very kind of monolithic structure of the electronic health system. And so some good examples of the type of data that we can extract and call electronic health information or put into that category is laboratory tests, medications, the coding of healthcare encounters, both at the hospital and ambulatory level, which is often coded by ICD-10 or 11, hospital-based text reports and ambulatory text reports. And you can see that the amount of structure of that data declines as we go down that list, becomes more unstructured. But the, the next value proposition of personalized care is really understanding for each individual patient, what disease do they have and what's happened to them? And this is usually provided through structured but also adjudicated labels of what the disease is and clinical outcomes. And that's a very important distinction because a lot of the data that we capture either by reporting or by recording has not been adjudicated. So while we feel there's great value in that data, it may have inherent error, bias, or noise. And so the challenge is to convert that data into reliable, uh, adjudicated, and validated definitions of disease. And so for example, by coronary angiography, we might call the presence of coronary disease. Whereas other tests may be surrogate markers, we have to have a reference standard. And there's other examples there, for example. And when an outcome occurs, it needs to be reviewed and adjudicated to confirm this person actually did have heart failure as a cause for their hospitalization. But where we're starting to see tremendous growth and value is in diagnostic data that's in its raw state. So once we've actually performed a diagnostic test, we store that data. It's not usually stored with an electronic health record. It's stored in archival servers that are separate. And those may be proprietary, they may be vendor neutral, but the, the data is stored in a non-tabular format. It's not structured, it's in its raw state. So this could be DICOM data, waveform data, raw genomic data, et cetera, proteomics. This data does not have a readily accessible home within our ecosystem. It's typically stored and archived. So it does have a home. It's just not a very accessible one to the daily practitioner. This data is often reviewed and then reported on and then stored. The motivation here is that it's the most granular data source that we have in healthcare to be able to build models, prediction models or classification models and you'll see right across the literature a rapid expansion of techniques that often leverage now uh, machine learning or deep learning techniques to be able to extract information from that data. It's important to know that it's more than 80% of the actual raw data we house in healthcare. So this is the majority of the data that we spend our efforts to store and archive. And finally, and I've left this one to the end because I actually feel it's one of the most important things is patient reported health markers at the time of care or testing. And these are things like social determinants of health or patient reported health measures, including symptoms, quality of life, et cetera. 
But the reason that this is so important is the title of this talk, Personalized Medicine. How do we actually contextualize all data that's captured across the health system, but individualize it to that individual on this particular day? We're actually not good at doing this. And largely the data that's required to do this doesn't exist within routine practice. So it often has to be sought in the form of PROMs or PREMs. And so these are examples at the bottom here where we can develop both cross-institutional standardized questionnaires, but also specific ones that are launched at targeted individuals that are here for a particular reason. Standardized questionnaires have been around for many years. The Seattle Angina questionnaire, for example, can be deployed at time of arrival for a patient that's being evaluated for chest pain syndromes or for um, uh, suspected coronary disease. These are validated tools to be able to contextualize to an individual patient. So if we bring together all of these, we must recognize that each time we go after one of these resources, it's resource intensive. And this is not recognized well enough that we expect in Alberta, I think, to have these data packaged already in barrels like oil, and we're going to just go and tap those barrels and great, we get to use it. Well, in fact, no, the healthcare system's not organized like that and the quality of the data is not such that we can do that. We can drill for it, but that's an investment. Each time we go after one of these data resources, we have to understand that there's a tremendous amount of effort that goes into each and every time we go after that data. It takes months to even years to be able to gain access, understand the structure of it, be able to bring it out appropriately, and obviously following all regulations and uh, privacy requirements. So this has been an intensive effort that we've been undertaking for many years to be able to understand where this data lies across the healthcare system, be able to work with our partners at Alberta Health Services and start to extract this data in a sustainable and iterative fashion. So it's not one time, but it actually starts flowing. By doing this systematically and each time investing many months, many uh, hours, um, and sometimes much in the way of financial resources as well, we've been able to extract these types of data sources and bring them flowing into a pipeline. But the pipeline is much broader than that. And getting the data that doesn't exist routinely within Alberta Health Services electronic data warehouse is where a tremendous amount of heavy lifting occurs. And so trying to extract resources that exist outside of that network such as raw diagnostic testing data, which we've put a lot of effort in, but we need to start thinking about other sources of data that are critical to the delivery of personalized care, such as genomics, proteomics, and the microbiome, wearables, remote patient monitoring, and again, those patient-specific uh, PROMs and PREMs. How do we bring those in is something that we need to think about as an organization. But all of this is flowing, as you can see, through a common pipeline, a data pipeline. And it needs to be recognized that once that data gets somewhere, you are now faced with the most resource intensive step of running a personalized medicine program, which is managing that data. So the management of health data at a programmatic level needs to really think of it and I'm gonna use the same analogy of Alberta's oil, you need to start with a refinery. You need to understand what is the data that's coming in? What's the quality of that data? How do we transform it, standardize it, and when necessary, augment it? After that, it can pass into a stage of creating packages. So data packages where there's schemas of data and those can live and be versioned and be referenced. And those are accompanied by appropriate data dictionaries and are stored in archives so that as investigators or researchers want to access the data, it exists within a pre-configured form and can be updated over time. Every time we do that, we have to consider the legal and regulatory compliance issues around data sharing, data governance, 
What are our data sharing agreements with Alberta Health Services? And what's the cybersecurity regarding the sharing of that data before we can ship it off to that customer and make sure that that customer, whoever that person is, whether it's an administrator or a researcher, that they're going to be successful in delivering what they want from that data. And this all has to exist within a circular reinforced financial architecture that's gonna make sure that it's sustainable and it, it can grow. And that inherently requires the assistance of in-house research and development and technology transfer and commercial platforms to be able to support it, such as you know, big data warehousing solutions, such as Google and Amazon. These are the types of partners that can provide a lot of foundational support and is something that Alberta Health Services and the University of Calgary are strongly pursuing. So just to come back to this data. So we've said that there's both structured and unstructured data in healthcare. What do we mean by that? Well, structured data is tabular. It can be des described and displayed and stored in relational databases. So the advantage of that is that the storage is generally small um, and the transformation of that data can be relatively uh, programmatically efficient. And so the issue then is whether that structured data is meaningful. And so many of you that may have worked with electronic health information may have already understood that the way that it's stored may not be in the way that you expect or in the way that you require to be able to make it valuable for your decision. And so it requires often transformation. Second, unstructured data, as I mentioned, is more than 80% of the healthcare data that exists. The challenge here is that yes, that means there's a tremendous amount of it and storage becomes problematic, but there's a lot of unique challenges as well that come with that or surrounding patient privacy. Um, and just how to pre-process that data appropriately to make it usable by the algorithms that want to use it. So the role of a personalized medicine program is really to establish a meaningful curated health data resource that can be accessible by all, considering all of those challenges. So back in um, 2015, we, we started to try to systematically tackle these many challenges in the form of the Cardiovascular Imaging Registry of Calgary. And in essence, this is why I was asked to try to take on the challenge of the Live and Precision Medicine Program, because we had gone through this process over many years and had developed some techniques and learned what not to do as well. And this, is, uh, this program was launched um, after ethics approved in 2014. And what we aimed to do was create a foundational infrastructure that when patients come through a service, they can be consented, we can catch, capture those problems, and we can link all of their electronic health information from across the entire ecosystem, as well as store their raw data for that diagnostic test. And so by being able to have both unstructured and structured data collected simultaneously, we create a resource that can be used for personalized care. But what are the things that we had to go through? And this list was achieved over many years, but going through the process of figuring out what I just mentioned, but also having to install dedicated servers behind the AHS firewall to be able to transfer data back and forth with Alberta Health Services, creating those established links with each of those members across the AHS system and automating the abstraction of the data from both tabular and unstructured sources. Um, this ultimately led to us being able to house all this data together on secure servers and start to access large scale computing resources to do something with it. So where are we today? By systematically engaging and consenting patients, and then every time that patient's been consented, we gain access to other resources that patient has provided to the, uh, the healthcare system, you start to get an expansive or proliferative growth of your data resources. 
because most of the people that have had an MRI, have had an echo, have had other tests, have had an angiogram, et cetera, and many ECGs. And so by tracking and developing programmatic ways to track these patients within the system, we can start to gain access to large matched and linked data resources. And so these data resources now are fairly unprecedented. Um, so if we look at other international uh, programs around the world, very, very few of them have access to these numbers, but certainly do not have access to curated data resources, consented data resources, and match to patient reported outcomes. So what can we do with these? So the whole point of this is to link it to meaningful outcomes or events. And so by developing automated electronic health data matching, being able to have standardized, validated, and citable data definitions for cardiovascular events, each one of these diagnostic test data can be linked to death interventions, outcomes that all have their own standardized definitions. And so by doing this, we provide very rapid assessments of a novel marker and what it means. And we can do this at scale. We can do this for not just one patient, 10, hundred, but tens of thousands of patients. So let's take a look at once you've organized the data in such a way, what you can do with it. Well, if we can bring all this data together and all of our data assets now have been linked by, we call them UIDs, these are unique identifiers. Uh, they're 34 character strings. Nobody can possibly know what each of the data packets means. Uh, we have to de-identify it using algorithms. And so this allows this data to now be matched and be able to provide the researchers security that they're meeting all of the HIPAA and uh, PIPEDA regulations. Once this has been provided, we can start to train novel algorithms to be able to improve diagnosis, predict outcomes, prevent bad outcomes, forecast costs, and deliver value-based care but that's very nice. What does it actually mean? Do we have any concrete examples? So we do. And so I'm just gonna show a few examples from just the last two years. And so this is one of our postdocs that's just joined our, our team actually, but this was during her PhD, um, being able to have access to large scale data resources to be able to do things like improve diagnosis by automating image analysis which is really what the foundational first step in the radiologic space of big data was used for, segmenting images. But we can go on and start to now say, well, what if we link imaging markers to outcomes? We can start to predict them. And so this was uh, a paper where um, looking at the influence of sex on whether or not pulmonary vein isolation was successful or not downstream. And so this was identifying that there are characteristics that women have with respect to atrial function that seem to identify that they do worse following pulmonary vein isolation. So again, starting to bridge the data from one place to another. And this is just another example of that for the heart failure teams saying, well, how do we identify your dilated cardiomyopathy patients that are at most likely, uh, the highest likelihood of coming in with heart failure or from dying of sudden cardiac arrest and identifying that there's markers on that MRI image called the midwall strie sign that very accurately discriminates patients at low versus high risk of those events. This really establishing that we can substratify dilated cardiomyopathy phenotypes into patients high versus low likelihood of major cardiovascular events. But this data can also be used for innovation. And so once we have a very large amount of data, we can train algorithms that are aimed at trying to find the heart within images, track that heart and build beating heart models. And so this is something that our group has worked on over the last ooh, eight years now, being able to do this from MRI images, which are on the top, CT images, which are on the bottom, but also 3D echo images. And this can then be used for discovery. So we can identify using this raw data, using neural networks, different disease states. 
And so great interest has emerged in trying to differentiate patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus having amyloid, versus having Anderson-Fabry disease, genetic cardiomyopathies. And we've learned that this data can allow for you to be able to do that fully automated. And we've got a large CIHR grant that's focused on that at an international level right now. But we can also find things that we didn't know existed. And so this is work by Dina Labib showing that patients with cancer have a unique phenotype to their hearts that we believe may be related to inflammatory changes invoked by active cancer. And so in patients that haven't yet received chemotherapy, we can identify patients that have cancer from their MRI images. And so this opens up lots of new possibilities, again, to use data, high quality match data, to be able to find unique disease signatures. But ultimately, what this talk is about is arriving at the destination of doing personalized care. And so can we make arguments that the framework that we've developed, the data assets that we've developed can be used to actually make better decisions? So this really is the concept of bringing all data together from across the health system. And so a couple of examples for you when you do that. So in almost 1,800 patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that had been having imaging performed, we looked at all the data assets across the health ecosystem and said, let's put them all together. So let's bring what the patient said about themselves on that day, the problems. Let's bring in the laboratory tests, the medications, and let's bring in the MRI findings, the imaging findings, and allow an algorithm to unbiasedly assess those data resources and pick out the ones that matter most. So a cross-domain phenomic assessment. And what we can find is that algorithms are very talented in doing this. And they do so in a way that we may not think about data. They do this in nonlinear associations. And so machine learning allows for nonlinear associations to be considered. And so when doing this, we could build a risk analysis using, this is called a random survival forest, where we could put patients into one of two categories, a high versus a low risk category. The high risk category, if you look in the bottom right, you'll see had a 34 fold higher risk of developing a heart failure admission. And the separation of these curves is immediate. So at 90 days, it was already 34 fold increased risk, but it also identifies people at 30 days. And so what does this mean? It means that we can leverage a diagnostic test that's being done for the purpose of diagnosis to establish prognosis. And we may be able to act on that. So this is where we're gonna talk in a minute about how do you actually act on these types of patient-specific predictions. But this is another example in a much larger number of patients, 7,600 patients, where the same approach was taken, but for the purpose of identifying patients with the first onset of new atrial fibrillation. So can we predict into the future, who is going to be the person that develops atrial fibrillation? And let's do, take the same approach. Let's bring in all of the variables that may be contributory, and we're going to allow an algorithm to find those variables for us. And in doing so, very similar results, 25-fold higher risk. We could identify a high-risk patient group that was approximately 30% of our referral population. This is a broad referral population that within 100 days was going to experience a 25-fold higher risk of atrial fibrillation. This allows us to consider patient-specific surveillance strategies. Maybe this person should have an eye watch. Maybe they should have a patch that will identify atrial fibrillation because the positive predictive value was actually very high in this cohort to be able to identify. So one in three of these people will actually develop atrial fibrillation within a very short time frame. And then finally, we have now emerging interest and ability to be able to explain these models. 
And so one of the biggest challenges faced by certainly the big data or uh, deep learning domains of health service predictions or, or uh, health outcome predictions is that physicians wanna know why. So if you tell me, hey, I ran an algorithm, guess what? This patient has an 82% chance of having an outcome in 100 days. I'll go, well, that's really nice. I have no idea how you did that because I wouldn't have guessed it. And I won't trust it. I mean, that's what physicians do. We've been trained. We've been uh, trained in the field of evidence-based medicine. We want to explain or have evidence as to why you came up with a prediction. So how can we do that? Well, this is fantastic work from Dina Labib, uh, working with June Lee, to be able to show on an individual patient basis, what are the variables that it chose and why? How much did it weight this variable over another variable? And so we can give a profile as to why the prediction was done and say, well, it was largely based on the person's age, but in this case, it was because their right ventricle was a little bit bigger than this one, and their GFR was a little bit lower. And so these things came together to find this prediction. That goes a long way in convincing physicians to make a decision. They go, okay, and explained it, thank you. So this is very much a part of the future of personalized medicine is explainability. And then just to add a final example, based on um, some of the value of now incorporating the raw data again, back in, and again, towards explainability, this is predicting the future occurrence of heart failure or death in patients that have undergone a TAVR, so transaortic valve replacement, but leveraging their routinely performed dynamic CT study to be able to make those predictions. And so by looking at how the heart is deforming on that multi-phase CT, we're able to identify patients that have a three times higher risk of having death or heart failure following successful TAVR. So we're not necessarily just focusing on using that CT to say, this is how you should position the valve, but rather leveraging that to say, at time of baseline assessment, we're going to let the patient and the physician know whether they're actually going to get clinical benefit from that valve being replaced. And that's something that works into personalized decision-making, but shared decision-making with physicians and patients. Do I wanna go through this? Is it worth it for me? So this approach has actually led to many things beyond what I've described. So the, the program that we put in place it stimulates more and more and more opportunities. And so what, what, what does standardized data collection do? Well, for somebody like June Lee, the approach registry, which really is the foundation of standardized data collection in Alberta, allowed him to apply for CIHR gr uh, grants to be able to develop machine learning based tools for patient specific modeling of revascularization using that data set, over, well over 100,000 patients worth of data that he's leveraging. We were able to use data assets to apply for CIHR grants to develop prediction algorithms of disease and outcomes in the international eight MRI study. This is at 10 sites from South America all the way to Hong Kong. And we were able to use the echocardiogram data to be able to ask Pfizer to allow us to start looking for cardiac amyloid from routinely performed uh, echocardiograms. So once you have the resources, it opens up opportunity. But it also has allowed us to start looking at rare diseases where we can combine genomics and pheno phenomics. Good examples, CIHR grant with um, Kate Hanneman from UHN, um, Anderson Fabry disease linking the phenotype and genotype, um, work across Alberta in muscular dystrophy, um, this being led, led by Gavin Udet, where we've combined uh, data from over 150 patients with muscular dystrophy and looking at uh, genomic and phenomic associations. 
and being able to rapidly find patients within our system that we can contribute to international efforts, such as the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy registry, um, led by uh, the national or funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and that, that's Chris Kramer and uh, Stefan Neubauer um, from Virginia and Oxford. And just to go on uh, just very quickly, but the, the value of having programs like this to support other researchers be successful in their own fields, because they all need the same access to high quality data resources. And so what we're able to do is provide these services to all of these other investigators to be successful. So where, where are we going? Well, really, I spent this portion of time to really get you to understand what the value of doing this is at scale. We to date have been working from the Stevenson Center with the CIROC registry to be able to pass this data down and engage affinity groups. And these are all the affinity groups that we currently work with to support research across the entire Libin Institute. So that value has been passed into those affinity groups. What we're now discussing is the Libin Precision Medicine Initiative where we want to flip that and for each affinity group, put them central. Understand what is it that this affinity group needs to deliver better personalized care and build a schema for each one of them. So it may be that you know, certain services do not need all access to all data resources, but they need specific things to answer their particular question. And so working with each of those groups to understand what data resources they require, but then execute on delivering it into a reproducible, sustainable, and repeatable data resource. If we can do that, we can start to get towards specific outcome risk prediction algorithms that are geared towards delivering care for that group. So for example, the heart failure group or the EP group or the minimally invasive valve surgery group may each have their own priority question that they want to build a prediction algorithm for. And that can be passed into a decision intervention phase where we actually say, well, based on that prediction, we can deliver a patient-specific clinical decision tree or support tool. And let's implement that in care. Let's actually shift the needle and improve the delivery of care at the Libin Institute. Can this really be done? Absolutely it can. And there is no better example of this being done in Alberta than the study by Matt James. And so if you haven't seen this study, you need to look at it because this was published recently in JAMA and is one of the best examples of how Alberta can deliver clinical decision support at scale across a very large footprint of Alberta. So this was a study looking at implementing clinical decision support to be able to change how physicians at the point of care of a coronary angiogram are delivering contrast and fluids. And that is elegant and simple and effective because what they developed was a prediction algorithm that was based on tens of thousands of patients from the approach registry, identifying how is it that these two variables affect the rate of acute kidney injury. Let's find the best prediction algorithm and now let's implement it. They put it right within the approach system and at time of patients with an acute kidney injury risk greater than 5%, they would be, uh, it was a, a, a step wedge cluster randomized trial. That's an excellent approach to being able to implement uh, large scale decisions that are across multiple uh, health systems. Um, this is probably one of the best approaches to implement personalized clinical decision support at scale. And what they showed was that by doing a simple risk estimation and decision support at time of intervention, they could reduce the risk of acute kidney injury with an odds ratio of 0.67. And so a 2.4% absolute reduction in the risk or occurrence of acute kidney injury. Just to show you, um, this was the interface that they used. 
um, very simply defined uh, based on uh, their risk calculator, what the estimated risk was and what the, uh, the recommended dose of contrast and IV fluids should be for that patient. The IV fluids based on the patient's left ventricular and diastolic pressure. Simple, elegant, effective. But you may ask, well, how does Connect Care influence our ability to do these things? And yes, they did it within the approach system. We are in an evolving, shifting landscape when it comes to information technology. Are we going to be able to continue innovating in the same way that we have in the past? Absolutely. In fact, this improves our capacity to do so. First, the one thing to recognize is that from a health data resource perspective, we're only getting better. So if you look here, these are the data assets that we draw from the electronic health information system. We're simply shifting some over from sourcing instead of from Sunrise Clinical Manager and ISCV, we shift them over to sourcing it from Epic. Um, this is just different data models. They're not necessarily always better. They're just different, okay? We just map those variables differently. That's not a problem. We have access to Alberta Health Services data warehouse. So we actually don't, we don't have to go into Epic to find these variables. They arrive, all variables in Alberta arrive to the electronic data warehouse. Um, we have access to the electronic data warehouse. We collect them from tables there. And the ability of Connect Care to be able to receive recommendations that we develop as an institute to say, for example, give less contrast, our ability to actually send those messages into Connect Care is there. We hope to be able to leverage the, the value of Connect Care to be able to assist with innovating personalized care. So where do the unique opportunities for program growth exist for us? Well, I've spent some time describing all the efforts that we've focused on diagnostic testing and raw diagnostic test data, the electronic health information. This has been a lot of work and a lot of value to create a foundation, but we need to focus on some really uh, unique opportunities here as an institute. Genomics, proteomics, and the microbiome are things that have sourced um, or demonstrated to be a very rich source of data for specific disease conditions. Targeted implementation and investment in specific diseases, very much worthwhile. And so we'll talk in a second about dilated cardiomyopathy, other genetic cardiomyopathies, but we need to invest here. Um, we are starting to see growth of scalable wearable and remote patient monitoring systems. We already have some very interesting discussions um, at the institutional level with potential partners. But finally, I wanted to um, spend a, just a brief moment to talk about non-hospital-based practice groups, because I think there is amazing opportunity here to be able to incorporate data that's being collected from these groups, such as fantastic example, Total Cardiology Research Network. They have some of the most amazing data on rehabilitation of any group across Canada. And this data really is not leveraged anywhere near as much as it could be for research and innovation. They recognize that, we should recognize that. So just briefly, I wanted to just mention that not all diseases that look the same act the same, okay? Phenomics doesn't get you all the way to the end goals. Understanding the genomics can change things dramatically. So patients with different types of genetic cardiomyopathy, which up to 30% of undifferentiated non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy can be genetic, the type of genetic mutation can dramatically change how that patient disease progresses and the outcomes that they experience. I'm not gonna to spend too much time here, but it is something that we as a group, as a heart failure group, as a, an institute need to consider and invest in as well as proteomics, um, other groups, collaborators of ours, very heavily focused on trying to bring in standardized approaches to biobank data from uh, targeted uh, groups such as dilated cardiomyopathy. So the core implementation team that's been put in place, um, I have a partner, uh, which is Melanie King, who's amazing. 
and is the Director of Program Development and Implementation for Precision Medicine. Um, she has already assembled an incredible team of uh, AHS data analysts, data engineers, project coordinators, and statistical uh, section leads um, that already provide an amazing foundation for me to work with. We have the guidance of Kathy Eastwood, who's chair of our steering committee. And our steering committee is second to none. Um, uh, any of you that uh, have been in the ecosystem of electronic data within Alberta know that this group is, uh, has been cherry picked from across Alberta to be the strategic partners of choice to make this happen for the Institute. And we have been considered one of the leading groups in the entire province to showcase the value that AHS's investments have been made in. Uh, working people uh, with people like Stafford Dean, Jeff Bacall, um, Amanda Weiss, obviously, um, but also all the people along the bottom that ha need no introduction, including um, the uh, recent development of Steve, Wil Steve Wilton um, leading the, uh, the SCN. So we're, we're, we're tremendously um, valued. And obviously Sandeep's work with Connect Care um, allows us to really be in lockstep as much as possible with the aims of Connect Care. The infrastructure that we've put in place and is being uh, additionally developed, um, we're not going to go into detail here today, other than to state that tremendous efforts and investment have been made to put servers in place to support the initiative and be able to migrate data appropriately according to HIPAA standards and according to AHS data sharing agreements. And we're working with AHS to make sure that this is done properly as well as have the right people in place at each of those locations to ensure that it's executed to the highest quality. Um, we have been working uh, towards establishing an international set of data standards and interoperability. Um, this was Dr. Labib's effort to actually review 37 international cardiovascular disease registries to get a curated set of variables that we will match all of Libin's data assets to so that if you want to get your outputs ma um, matched or calibrated to STS um, or to Sweetheart, that we have mechanisms to be able to match those data resources. That data schema sits in one of 15 interoperable platforms that have either been or are being developed to be able to support the initiative. Um, and once data has passed through this framework, it is then sent into uh, repository where we can transform and display it, combine and explore those data assets, but we're also trying to use open source software tools to be able to allow unstructured data such as DICOM and ECG to be also made available to investigators and have the ability to work with these open source tools to be able to custom develop solutions for themselves and be able to access uh, model training environments. How do you do that? you need help, tremendous help. And so working with data science teams from across Alberta, these are the individuals that get us to understand how to do this properly, to be able to do the, the data gymnastics that is challenging and has to be done properly. These are each leaders in the field. Um, I wish I had the time to tell you a bit more about these individuals, um, but you recognize many of them, obviously Huda Kwan Jun Lee, you know very well, Marina Gavrilova and Farhad Milaki um, from Computer Sciences and Russ Greiner um, from the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. So to conclude, um, you know, they're deliverables from this. And I hope that you've seen what those deliverables can be and why there's been interest for the engagement to expand what we did first with the CIROC registry and be able to develop it for affinity groups across the Institute. Um, the value for institutional leadership is clear. Um, it's a proven process for structuring data resources to enable uh, value-based care uh, related activities, innovation for the Institute, catalyze research and innovation. The University of Calgary wants to see this. This is their mandate is to generate innovation, technology transfer, demonstrate that Alberta can be a place of innovation, um, personalized care delivery, being able to introduce those longitudinal PROMs and PREMs and clinical decision support, ultimately towards the patients. 
um, being able to have patient engagement, make sure that they understand as an institute what we're doing for them and be able to report on what that impact is. But for the affinity groups, the ability for us to provide services to give you curated, meaningful data resources, that's the bottom line. Understanding what it is that you need as data resources to make better care decisions. We're not trying to provide anything other than support, assistance, and innovation for your service. Um, obviously, being able to work individually with those groups to develop what those uh, specific problems and data resources should be is going to be a priority now that I'm uh, in this in this role um, and working with each of those groups to develop personalized care strategies. Um, the timeline, uh, I can provide this to anybody, just communicate with us. Uh, it'll under, let you understand where are we today? Where can you engage with us? The, the answer is now. Um, we have been working very hard behind the scenes, even um, uh, obviously uh, largely led by Melanie, um, but we are far into all of the integration with Alberta Health Services with respect to structured and unstructured data. Um, we are working towards uh, deployment of this environment, um, which is basically clinic or affinity group based, with plans over the next six months to launch into our first group. This likely is going to be the minimally invasive bowel surgery group because they're very much engaged. They have very good preparation and it's a small enough group that we know that we can work with them very effectively to decide how these strategies should be replicated in the future. So that's our probably our test group. Once we've done that fully and executed it properly, we can replicate that quicker and quicker and quicker towards then developing precision impact projects. And the impact projects are really based on trying to find the source of the ideas that are valuable to be able to bring into a modeling environment and create clinical decision support tools. And we hope that by the end of 2023, we can actually launch our first impact project to actually say, okay, of the available outcomes that you want to show in the healthcare system have shifted. Let's design similar to how Matt James did, design a clinical decision intervention, implement it, track those patients, and show what the impact on value-based care is. That's the endpoint. We have to be able to demonstrate we are delivering better care at lower cost. And that's how this program ultimately will be sustained. 